con una invitada y de presentar a Cecilia Weinrich, que es profesora titular e investigadora de la Universidad de Utah en Salt Lake City, en Estados Unidos. Y Cecilia tiene una larga trayectoria en investigación eh, en varios tópicos, pero fundamentalmente en la manera como las personas y los niños y los jóvenes hacen sentido eh, de situaciones que involucran ya cuando uno daña a alguien o que alguien resulta tratado con injusticia y de comprender las maneras en que esta, se resuelven estos conflictos que pueden ser sociales, interpersonales y eh, algo que me parece muy interesante porque mi corazón también está en la psicología evolutiva es cuáles son las implicancias de cómo uno enfrenta y significa estos fenómenos para el desarrollo moral, las capacidades de particularmente situaciones de transgresión. Ahora, eh, si ustedes leen su currículum y su récord de publicaciones, que es tremendamente eh, productivo e interesante, se van a dar cuenta de que ella no tiene únicamente, o no ha desarrollado solamente un scholarship en estas situaciones de interconflicto personal que son parte de la moral del día a día, de la vida normal de todos los niños. ¿eh? alguien se ofendió, vimos los sentimientos, sino que también ha tenido un interés bastante sistemático en el estudio de conflicto social en eh, niños y jóvenes que crecen en zonas de conflicto, conflicto de sus países que son desplazados por guerras, guerras tribales, escenarios de conflicto eh, intenso que amenazan la sobrevivencia de algunos grupos y ha publicado bastante en distintas poblaciones, tanto niños y familias desplazadas en Colombia, como guerras tribales, como eh, niños en zonas de guerra en el Medio Oriente. Entonces, me parece que es extraordinariamente interesante su experiencia, su resultado, y las último, pero no menos importante, que es lo que hemos estado ayudando a trabajar esta semana en nuestro proyecto de compromiso cívico, ha ensayado con muy distintas metodologías. Inicialmente con muchos estudios con escenarios simulados de conflicto y después largamente con el análisis de las narrativas y también ahora con eh, indicadores de, eh, psico, de respuestas psicofisiológicas. Entonces me parece que es eh, un honor tenerla en nuestro coloquio y queremos escuchar sin adelantarme más de su investigación. ¿No? Gracias, Roberto. Hay, eh, yo soy de Argentina, pero, o sea, nací en Argentina y la mitad de mi corazón es en Argentina, pero viví y me formé y trabajo en Estados Unidos. Entonces, mi castellano es como infantil. <risa> Podemos charlar en castellano, pero me cuesta mucho hablar de mi trabajo en castellano. Entonces, si ustedes me perdonan, yo, si me permiten, yo hablo en inglés y luego hacemos preguntas y respuestas en castellano como les resulte más cómodo. También en cualquier momento que yo diga algo que no entiendan, por favor me interrumpen sin ninguna formalidad. Me dicen, ¿qué es lo que dijiste? Porque yo quiero que sí entiendan, ¿no? no. Entonces, si me... Pero no se piensen que soy una snob y por eso hablo no hace inglés. Es lo que me da, me da pena, pero es que me resulta muy difícil explicar los conceptos eh, en inglés. Sí, pero en, en, en castellano, pero sí podemos conversar luego en castellano de todo lo que eh, lo que tenga. ¿Está bien? Bien. Entonces, um, today I, I want to I want to give a talk that's not um, empirical. It's not a report of a particular study. It's rather a conceptual talk where I want to cover a lot of grounds. I want I have two main goals. One is I want to talk about moral agency. What is moral agency and how do we situate the concept, the construct of moral agency within contemporary moral theory and the theory of moral development. Okay? ¿Me van entendiendo? Sí, ¿no es cierto? Bien. ¿Me preguntan si no? Okay, good. Um, so first I want to talk about moral agency and situate moral agency within contemporary moral theory. And then I want to talk about how the development of moral agency is affected 
by living and growing up in situations of political violence. Okay? Now, as you probably, most of you know anyway, beginning with, say, Piaget in the 1930s and then Kohlberg in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and many other people studying moral development, um, the study of moral development has largely been focused on um, understanding how children develop moral concepts and the types of moral judgments that children make about different situations. And contemporary moral development theory, as opposed to, say, early Piagetian theory, has shown with much reliability, without, you know, there are thousands of studies about that, that um, children make, even very young children, as young as three or four or five years old, make consistent judgments that it is wrong to hurt up to treat other people unfairly, it's wrong to hurt other people, right? There's no argument about that, there's no debate. That's something that's well known in, in the theory and in, in, in the research. Now, even though children, even very young children, say that it's wrong to hurt others, that doesn't mean that children never hurt others, right? In fact, you know, most children will sometimes hurt, act in ways that hurt other people. Children sometimes hurt their siblings, their brothers and sisters, always. That's what brothers and sisters are for. You know, you hurt them, you take their stuff away, right? You push them, you call them names. Children hurt their, their friends. Um, they exclude their friends from games. Children uh, sometimes divulge secrets that their friends told them, right? So children do harmful, mean things over the internet. That's a very modern way of looking at how children hurt one another. So in normal everyday life, children hurt each other and act in ways that are unfair to, to, towards one another. So there's often inconsistencies right, between um, moral thinking and moral behavior. What children say and think it's right and wrong and what they do. And by the way, that's not only children. We adults also often act in ways that hurt other people, right? In fact, interpersonal harm is an intrinsic, inevitable part of everyday life. Interpersonal harm is an intrinsic, inevitable part of moral life, of our moral lives. So, um, Um, how to think about these inconsistencies? It has become quite common for people to resolve these inconsistencies by saying, look, don't worry about moral thinking. Moral thinking is not that important. We should look at, at moral behavior, right? Moral thinking is just a rationalization. And after, a fact, after the fact, every phenomenon, who cares about moral thinking? Well, um, I actually think that um, we need a different perspective. I think moral, although we do sometimes rationalize, um, not all moral thinking is a rationalization. And I think we need a perspective that actually pays close attention to the moments of tension between moral thinking and moral behavior. I think those moments of tension are really important. So, um, So how to think about those moments of tension, of inconsistency, of conflict between moral thinking, what we think is right and wrong, and what we do? First of all, I think it's important to understand, and I hope you agree with me, that being a moral person is not the same as being a saint. Being a moral person is not never hurting anybody, always doing only the right thing. I think moral sainthood um, it's overrated. Um, I mean, sainthood, there may be a place for sainthood in theology, but as far as um, psychology and developmental psychology, I think moral sainthood is overrated. And so I think that, um, as, I, as I said before, I think interpersonal harm is an in inevitable part of everyday life, and therefore, being a moral person includes knowing what is right and wrong, and trying to do the right thing, but being a moral person also includes recognizing our capacity to hurt others. And grappling with those, grappling means learning, 
trying to make sense of those instances when we hurt other people. So rather than thinking about moral saints or people who are not moral saints and therefore are not moral, we need to understand that becoming a moral person includes not only moral concepts, knowing what is right and wrong, but also recognizing that we can hurt others and trying to figure out, um, trying to learn from those situations. And that's why those moments of tension between children's moral concepts and behaviors constitute actually a very important context for moral development. You're all with me so far? Yes. Now, how does it happen? How does it happen that these moments of tension, these moments of inconsistency between moral concepts and actions, how do they become a context for moral development? Um, I thought about it for a long time. That was um, early on after I got my PhD for a few years. I've been pondering how to study this. And, um, at some point, I realized that one way to understand how this happens, how this process may, may work, is to analyze, to look at how children account for, how children explain, how children remember and describe those times when they cause harm to another person. And in the last 12 or 15 years, um, we've been collecting stories. Um, different kinds of stories, but all of them have, in general, that theme of um, tell me about times when you hurt another person. Tell me about times when someone hurt you. Tell me about times when um, you treated someone unfairly. I mean, we have all kinds of variations, but the essence of it is we're trying to get kids to tell us how they remember and how they account for and how they explain those very everyday situations of interpersonal. And we have, at this point, as telling Loreto, we have around 5,000 stories like that, at least. And I want to give you two examples. We're going to start with two examples now. I did choose examples in Spanish, because I think they're going to be a little easier to, uh, for you to read quickly with me. Important that you read them with me. Um, these two I tr are translated from English, but then I'll, I'll give you some that are actually originally in Spanish. So, um, the first example is by a five-year-old. The second example is by a 17-year-old. And I'm going to read them, read them along with me. The five-year-old. So the, um, the question was, can you tell me about a time when you did or said something that hurt another person? So this five-year-old boy says, Hoy le pegué a Tommy en la cabeza con un martillo rojo y se puso a llorar. Hmm? That's a very typical story of a five-year-old. How about a 17-year-old? Mm, a ver, esto fue un par de meses atrás. Íbamos a un partido y paramos a comer algo y uno de mis amigos estaba por ahí sin pagar. Y yo le dije, epa, y entonces me acerqué y le dije, vos comiste lo más caro, no esperarás. It's translated into Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> Now I realize that. Uh, y yo le dije, epa, y entonces y me acerqué a él y le dije, vos comiste lo más caro, no, esperas, no esperarás ahora que nosotros paguemos por vos, ¿no? Y le hablé mal, le dije, volví acá, de él. y le dije, ya mismo. Entonces, y, 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 yo, y yo le vi la cara que él estaba como herido por lo que le dije, pero en ese momento pensé que yo tenía razón, porque uno no se puede ir así sin pagar. Entonces, esta fue la vez que yo le dije algo a alguien y que siento que lo herí mucho. Y después, más tarde, descubrí que él no tenía nada de plata y uno de, sus, uno de nuestros amigos iba a pagar por él y él le iba a devolver más. Y, pero yo no había averiguado todo esto, detalles antes de acercarme a él y decirle lo que le dije. Y entonces, sí, fue esa vez que quería a alguien bastante mal. ¿Ok? That's a very typical story of the 17 year old. Uh, they also tell us other typical stories, are romantic stories about cheating on their girlfriend or anything like that. These accounts are quite typical. Five-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and you know, 16, 17 year olds um, Today, I will not talk about the development. How does it happen that we go from there to here? There's a whole process. A lot of developmental pieces have to come into place for kids to be able to go from that early story, very short, key, you know, uh, concrete story, to this more complicated story. But that's for next year, when I come back next year. Good. This year, <laughs> this year, promise. Yeah, right. This year, we're gonna uh, focus on the more elaborated stories that are typical. <coughs> By the time kids are 10, 11, 12, um, most kids can tell you stories like this, uh, and they have no problem sharing stories about times that hurt other people. Now, 
So let's look at that kind of story in a little more um, detail. This kind of story includes, um, there are, and, and we spend almost a whole week look, talking about different ways to analyze narratives. And I'm just going to focus on one particular one that's of interest to me today. But these guys now that spend a whole week you know, with, with me, they probably are already analyzing all kinds of other things in this story. But anyway, um, this story includes two kinds of very different, distinct information. First of all, this story includes many references to factual elements, okay, to, um, to reference to who did what, where, when, okay, the facts of the story, the observable elements of the story. Uh, so this kid tells us, you know, his friend left without paying, and then he said, I walked up to him and I told him. Those are all things that if you were sitting at the other table looking, you would have seen it too, right? Those are factual components of the story. And knowing who did what and where and when are obviously very important for understanding what happened. But factual information alone, on its own, would not be enough to understand this event as a full event. To really fully make sense of what happened in this little conflict, right? One also needs to know some internal meanings, okay? Um, and this story, oh, sorry, I forgot to do that. This story definitely have, um, includes many references to internal meanings, to mental elements or psychological elements of the situation, as opposed to factual elements. Um, so this kid tells us what he was thinking, what he thought was going on, what he thought his friend was going to do, how he felt about it, and he told us what he thought his friend, how his friend felt, right? Those were all non-observable, but rather inferable, because they're mental elements of, um, of the experience. So um, it's the combination. In fact, when we try to account for an event, when we try to explain and justify an event, uh, it's the combination of factual and psychological elements that, um, that allow us to understand an event like that not simply as a sequence of actions. He did this, then I did that, then he did this, and I did that. Not just as a sequence of actions, but actually as a comprehensible human interaction. It's the combination of the two types of elements that give us that sense of what's going on and why, why is he doing this, why is he responding that way, and so on. So it's by putting together what he did and what his friend did with what he was thinking and what he thought his friend was feeling and so on that this kid can actually make sense of having of an event where he hurt another person. Now, as kids grapple with, as, as kids try to make sense of times when they hurt other people, they come to connect their own wrongdoing um, to their own sense of agency. And what that means is that they come to understand that my hurtful actions, my going up to him and saying, hey, que pasó? Hmm? My hurtful actions are connected to my thoughts, to my desires, to my feelings, to my intentions, to my goals, to what I thought was true, to what I thought was going on. So my actions are connected to myself, to my sense of agency, to my sense of um, a, moral, um, a moral agent. And by moral, we mean uh, not the person who is good, necessarily, but our own sense of agency around moral events. Not only that, but this kid, for instance, and most kids do too, also ponder what the other person was thinking and feeling and intending, what goals they had, and so on. Now, sometimes they're wrong because we can't read other people's minds, right? Sometimes they're wrong, but they still have inferences about the other person's internality, about the other person's mental state. And so not only are they constructing a sense of their own agency around moral events, but they're also connecting the other people's actions to a sense of those people, um, those people's internality, those people's sense of agency. And so in this process, in this continuous process of 
grappling with everyday instances of moral wrongdoing, he has begun constructing a world of moral agents. Um, a world where people with distinct internal experiences, distinct understandings, distinct goals, um, distinct beliefs, a pe people with distinct um, internal states interact with one another in ways that result sometimes in conflicts and disagreements and fights. Not only that, but I want to say that the richness of the internal description that this kid and most kids provide of their accounts of moral wrongdoing contain the foundation by which, say, this boy in this situation can understand that he hurt another person, uh, feel badly about it, uh, learn a moral lesson for the future, which he probably did, and also probably forgive himself. You know, in the sense that he says, well, I really should have asked him, but I didn't, which is a human thing, okay? All right, now, uh, the question that I want to discuss now that we talked a little bit about moral agency in general is um, what happens to this process of constructing a sense of your own moral agency and other, people moral, other people's moral agency? What happens to this process when uh, children are chronically exposed to extreme forms of community violence, political violence, and political violence. And uh, just in case you're thinking this is a small problem, um, unfortunately it isn't. And I'm just giving you some um, references to the sort of impact that war and political violence have on children in the world. Um, one billion children, this is the last statistics from um, the United Nations, one billion children today live in countries affected by armed conflict. Two million, million children were killed in the last decade alone. Six million children disabled. Children are separated from their parents. They're dislocated from their communities. Internally or externally, they become either internally displaced or refugees in other countries. And there are and this is probably an underestimate of the United Nations, around 300,000 children across the world who have been uh, participating directly in different kinds of guerrillas and armed groups. And so the proportions of this problem are uh, just stark. Okay. Now, constructing a sense of moral agency in the midst of political violence is um, it's particularly challenging for several reasons, and I want to say a little bit about each one of them. Uh, first of all, the harmful interactions that I was describing before in you know in more typical context, like hitting your brother, taking you know taking your sister's toy away, telling a secret, or you know yelling at your friend. Um, those those instances of harm rarely challenge uh, the basic faith that people, that young people have in themselves and in others as moral agents, okay? Because there is a sense in which those arms can be undone. Mm -hmm. I can say, I'm sorry. I can explain how it happened. I cannot do it again. Those harms have a way of being repaired. Um, by comparison, the sort of, the sort of extreme harms and atrocity, atrocities that war exposed children um, experience as victims uh, and as perpetrators. Killing, murder, torture, uh, destruction of villages, um, those, those types of harm can uh, and do challenge people's fa basic faith in themselves and other people as, um, as moral agents in a much more profound way. So the types of harm are uniquely challenging. Um, to make things more complicated, parents and other adults who are often uh, in more typical contexts available to help kids make sense of their own wrongdoing. Why did you do that? What were you thinking? How did you think you felt? What can you do now? Let's call him and apologize, okay? The kinds of things that parents and teachers normally do are more absent in this case because 
either parents are dead or somewhere else, or even if they're there, they're typically um, overwhelmed and psychologically unavailable. So uh, uh, unavailable to offer this sort of scaffolding that children did, do, that children need in order to make sense of their own wrongdoing and repair those wrongdoings. Um, at a more broad collective level, the polarized war rhetoric offers very little in the form of societal containing, right? Um, and finally, and we are um, looking at these things now in, in our psychophysiological lab as well, hyperarousal that, that comes with exposure to extreme violence, the exposure to extreme violence tends to provoke the sort of hyperarousal that encourages numbing or avoidance. What's the word for numbing in Spanish? Insensibilization. Yeah. Insensibilization, exactly. Yeah. Numbing and, or avoidance. Um, and numbing and avoidance are the enemies of agency construction. Okay? So, um, oops, let's talk for a minute. Okay, so, um, this doesn't mean that um, children growing up in war contexts are not moral. It does not mean that. And in fact, my own research, I've done quite a lot of research on that, um, before we started with the stories, and other people's research um, has have demonstrated that uh, even when kids grow up in conflicts, in situations of violence, political or community violence, they still construct moral concepts about justice, about welfare, about rights. Um, it's also widely acknowledged today more than before that war-affected youth are not just victims of their circumstances, right? They're not passive victims, they are actively um, grappling with the violent events that surround their lives. Um, through the lens of their own understanding of those events. Still, our work suggests that this process of active sense-making uh, that kids engage in is not without challenges. In particular, in relation to moral meanings and to moral meaning-making, it's often difficult for war-affected youth to make sense of their experiences in ways that promote and preserve a sense of themselves as moral agents and a sense of other people as moral agents. And those difficulties obviously are captured pretty well in the ways in which they narrate their own experiences with violence. And so in the last six to eight years, we started collecting um, stories, similar stories to the ones that we collected in typical contexts, but now in different countries at war. So we've been to Bosnia, we've been to Papua New Guinea, where there are tribal wars, we've been to Colombia, you know. Uh, the situation there within the Middle East. And so we have now about 1,500 or 2,000 accounts uh, from kids in those situations, again, about their own experiences with war and conflict, but also their own experiences of interpersonal uh, conflicts with other people. And so today, uh, now obviously kids tell the stories in many different ways. I'm not gonna, uh, like I said, I'm not gonna do an empirical uh, presentation where I'm going to give you percentages of this or that, it's actually pretty hard to do that right with these kinds of samples because obviously uh, when you're working in war, when you go to war countries, you don't have the luxury of control groups and you know the right kind of samples, representative samples. You grab what you can and try to make sense of it. So when you look at people telling you this percentage, that percentage of kids, you really have to ask yourself percentage of whom it's very hard. It's not the same as doing work in a laboratory. Um, so rather than talking about percentages, well, I played three types of storytellings, three types of agency construction that we have followed through and we know are quite problematic. They are very, they're widespread, they're very common, and they're quite problematic and you will, uh, we'll read the stories at, um, together and uh, it, you won't be surprised that these are pro problematic. And we catalog them around around the world. So the first example is um, a 14-year-old um, boy from Colombia. And he was um, in one of the armed groups. At the time that we interviewed him, he had just left the armed group. And that's how we uh, got to him. So 14-year-olds, and this is what he said. Again, the story, the question is, tell me about the time that you did who said something and someone ended up getting hurt. And this kid said, uh, and it is in Spanish originally, ese día no, pues, 
Pues fue ahí cuando a mí me ordenaron que matara a alguien y pues nosotros fuimos, salimos como, como tres y, y digamos y matamos a un policía y después salimos pues la guerrilla me dijo que matara a alguien entonces pues me mandaron entonces nosotros llegamos y, y matamos a un policía y después volvimos, volvimos al, al campamento ¿y qué más te acuerdas? eso, nada más, lo matamos ¿ok? Now, this account is problematic on many levels, um, but in particular it is problematic because, and I'm not talking about just what the child did, that, you know, he's talking about killing someone, but the account of the killing is problematic in as much as it fails to articulate any sense in which this kid's actions arise from his own psychological experience. So if you remember the previous story of the 14-year-old who you know, was mean to his friend, but how he was able to connect his actions to what he was thinking and feeling and what he meant to do and what he intended and so on, that's missing here. Internal experience, mental experience is missing. This kid gives, gives us some facts um, about what he did and what other people said or did, but the motivations, the feelings, the thoughts underlying his own behaviors and other people's actions um, are left unstated. Okay, we don't know why he thought or why he felt he was ordered to kill this person, why he obeyed, what he thought while he was doing it, or afterwards, what he felt afterwards, what he thought the other person meant. I mean, none of that is addressed. This is one of the most typical stories that we um, have, and uh, it's <coughs> typical not just in Colombia. Uh, but it's typical around the world in situations of extreme violence. This form of, and we call that NAM agency, okay? ¿Cómo era? Insensibilizado, algo así. This form of NAM, NAM agency construction reflects the collapse um, or the shutting down of the capacity to think, to organize, to feel. At least the temporary shutting down of the capacity to organize your own experience. Now, this numbing, this numbing strategy is protective in the short term. When they're telling you to kill someone, you should not, or it's hard to stop and think and feel, okay? You just do it. Um, but so killing, uh, so thinking and feeling may not be adaptive while you're doing it. Um, so this is a, this may be an adaptive, maybe a protective strategy, strategy in, the sh in the short term, but the numbing of agency is a sort, source of serious concern because it implies that these young people are unable to recognize the connection between their own behaviors and the sense of who they are. Um, over the long term, this way of constructing their own moral agency um, might result in, youth, in young people developing a view of the world in which they actually cease to notice. They no longer notice the, um, the ways in which their own actions and perhaps other people's actions have moral relevance. Um, so the sense of moral agency is really shut down. In the long term, this numbing is also known, and there is research about that, not to be associated with high, much higher risk of aggression. Um, the next example, and we'll get back and talk a little bit about all of the examples, but let me give you another one because I want you to have at least a picture of some options. The next example is um, a story also by, by a 14 year old, and I actually realized that I, I chose only boys, but I have um, examples of girls as well. In Colombia, half the child soldiers were girls. Mm -hmm. uh, but the next example is also a story of a 14 year old boy, this time from Papua New Guinea. Um, I don't know how much you know about Papua New Guinea, but I didn't know much when I started working there, but Papua New Guinea is a tribal society with a history of 400 years of continuous warfare, tribal warfare, okay? Uh, where the fighting is typically organized around well-defined enemies. This is my tribe, this is that tribe, they are our enemies, right? And it's as, as opposed to Colombia where there were many groups fighting each other and often kids from the same family went into different groups. So one went to one group, and the brother went to another group, the father or the uncle went to another group. That's not true in Papua New Guinea. In Papua New Guinea, it's clearly defined as us and them. 
It's our tribe versus other tribe. And this kid's story that I'm gonna show you now, it's an excerpt, it's a shorter, um, it's a fragment from a longer story that this boy, this boy told us about how he, together with other young men from his tribe, engaged in attacking people from another tribe when, the lear when they learned that a girl from their tribe had been raped by members from the other tribe. So I took out the rape, okay? So you, don't, you won't hear the part about the rape, but that's, what, that's how this thing got started. Cuando se estaba terminando el baile, él vio a una chica sangrando y nos avisó a los gritos a todos los miembros de nuestra tri tribu. Y yo y algunos de otros miembros de mi tribu lo escuchamos y tomamos nuestros cuchillos de monte y salimos corriendo. Y llegamos al lugar donde era el baile y empezamos a buscar a ver si encontrábamos a alguien de la tribu de los violadores. Había muchas, muchas, muchas personas por ahí, pero nadie de la tribu de los violadores. Nos sentimos muy frustrados y prendimos fuego a sus chozas y tratamos de encontrar a algún hombre de esa tribu para matar, pero no pudimos encontrar ni uno. Entonces nos fuimos de su pueblo, y temprano a la mañana siguiente los miembros de mi tribu empezaron a llamar desde todos los rincones, y todos nos juntamos abajo en el pueblo. Los ancianos discutieron sobre la violación y decidieron que atacaríamos a la tribu de los violadores. Después de esa discusión nos fuimos al pueblo de ellos y empezamos una guerra. Pero no habíamos traído ninguna arma, solo arcos y flechas. Entonces destruimos sus jardines y cortamos sus árboles más grandes, pero mientras estábamos destruyendo su villaje, ellos mataron a uno de nuestros hombres. Y la guerra duró como una semana, y ahí nos dimos cuenta que no estábamos ganando. Y entonces los ancianos lo pensaron otra vez y decidieron terminar la guerra. Now, this is very typical of Papua New Guinea, where wars, tribal wars start because one tribe attacks the other. Now, in this case, it was a rape of a girl, or at least they thought there was a rape, right? Because they never found evidence to that. But sometimes it's because someone comes and steals your goat, which, believe me, it's much more valuable than any girl, okay? <laughs> so they steal your goat, they steal our goats, we go and you know kill a bunch of people, and for, I told you there, were, there have been 400 years of warfare there, they used to do bows and arrows, mm -hmm. okay? And so they do a week of bows and arrows, they kill two or three people, then everyone goes back to their tribe uh, until someone else takes another goat, and then they, now, in the last 50 years, small arms, weapons came in. And so when warfare starts, and last week, instead of killing one or two or three people, they killed maybe 300 people. So it's a disaster. I mean, this is the, one of the most dangerous places in the world. And, uh, but kids participate, and even young kids have that sense of, you know, it's our tribe, we go and start the war, then they tell us we're, we're losing, so we're gonna, you know, stop the war for now, until next time. Now, this story is very different from the previous story, not just in content, again, you know, the content is different, but um, the form of the story, um, in this story, we hear about these kids' actions and, you know, the, the tribe, the, these kids' tribes, what they did. Um, the, we get a fairly good sense of what they're doing and why they're doing it, and, and their sense of moral agency is constructed fairly clearly. So part of the story is about them engaging in violence, and part of the story is about them trying to decide whether they should continue the violence or not, whether they're winning or losing. In each case, um, their actions are connected to some sense of internality of what they're thinking, what they thought happened, how they felt about it, what they wanted to do. They got together, they talked about it, they decided what they wanted to do, then they thought about it again. There's a lot of sense, you get a sense of people thinking. Now, whether we like or not what they're doing, that's not the point. The point is that their own actions in their story is constructed around a clear sense of their own sense of internality. But when you think about how do they construct, how does this kid construct the other people's internality from the other tribe, that's completely absent. Right? So what those other people may have been thinking, what they intended, if they did it on purpose or not, or if it was, or there was an accident, whether they even did it. Um, uh, 
we only hear about the other tribe in terms of actions, uh, but we don't hear any speculation about the other people's internality. Um, this account is problematic in a different way from the num account. This is what we call an imbalanced construction of agency, right? Um, it implicates a relative imbal imbalance in the ways the, that kids articulate their own agency versus other, other people's agency. And so kids will construct themselves and members of their own group, their in-group, as people motivated by beliefs, desires, thoughts, but they won't construct the others as moral agents. And this imbalanced or polarized, polarized sense of agency um, that emphasizes other people's actions without connecting them to a sense of internality is likely to make it easier to aggress against the others, right? There is a form, there is a way, a sense in which the others don't exist as real humans with depth. Does that make sense? And so we have found in some of our work that kids who construct um, an imbalanced sense of agency are kids who tend to engage in cycles of violence, okay? Because uh, it's much easier to aggress against someone who's not constructed uh, with a sense of intimacy. And the third and final example for today, so we have plenty of time to talk, is another example that I want to share from Colombia. Um, this is an account from a 16-year-old boy and I have to warn you that the details are gruesome, and my goal is not to horrify you. Um, I want you to think through the experience with me, okay? So again, this is a 16 year, he was 16 years old at the time of the interview. El día que le hice de daño a una persona fue el día que mataron a unos primos a unos primos míos. Ese día estábamos peleando en las autodefensas campesinas y en el combate murieron tres, vivos, tres primos míos. Lo mataron. Ese día cogimos, matamos a 25 paracos paramilitares, right? Cogimos a 10. Y la orden del comandante era que los despedazáramos y los mandáramos despedazados donde la familia de cada cual. Y ese día fue el que de la rabia de haber visto a mis primos muertos por manos de las mismas personas que habíamos cogido me dio tanta rabia que empecé quitándole los dedos a una persona con una motosierra. Le quité los dedos de ambas manos, después el brazo, le fui cortando el brazo hasta que llegué a los hombros, después empecé con los pies y le quité todo hasta quitarle la cabeza, y le saqué la lengua y le quité los ojos y se los mandé todo a la mamá de él. Ese día no me olvidaré nunca y siempre cargo con ese peso. Estando acá, lo recuerdo y a veces me dan ganas de llorar de haberle hecho eso a una persona. Y a los pocos días reflexioné y me dije, ¿cómo será la muerte mía? ¿Será? ¿Qué será? ¿Sí mismo o cómo? Um, this account, it's shocking, isn't it? It's very shocking. Um, and it's, it's not the only one that we got um, that way. Um, this account, as, as many of the events that these young people, these young guy kids, have described to us, the account itself seems to be organized on a, around an instance of coercion, right? The, this is not surprising, as it was often the case that these youth were ordered to kill or ordered to uh, torture other people. And yet, when this kid recounts the events of that day, he doesn't say, um, I was ordered to do it. Um, he doesn't say, it was not my fault. He doesn't say, I had no choice. On the contrary, this kid actually grapples with his own agency in those events. Um, his sense of his own internality, of his own mental state, uh, is deeply implicated in his actions. Uh, this boy explains not that he didn't do it because the commandante told him to do it. He did it because, he, because of his rage. Mm -hmm. He was so enraged that his cousins had been killed that the rage led him to do this. Um, this boy um, explains how his desire for revenge, um, not the commandante's orders, drove him to this behavior. 
as a result, this deeply or this deeply horrifying um, actions, these deeply horrifying actions are rendered actually comprehensible in a way that the first story wasn't. Okay? Um, they're, they're rendered comprehensible to us and presumably to him too. Right? Um, so in this sense, this is the opposite of a numb telling. But what's wrong with it? The problem here is that this boy, this boy appears to be haunted um, by his actions, as though these actions and their consequences are inescapable. He cannot escape them. And he draws a pervasive and enduring negative causal meaning in relation to the kind of person he is, right? To his future self, he says, he projects himself into an future self. I will never forget. I will always carry this burden. Um, this is what we call a uh, rigidified construction of agency um, or essentialized. Now, this youth constructs a rigidified or essentialized or frozen understanding of himself, one for which cha change or redemption seem impossible. Uh, precisely because of this, rigidified constructions of agency may be somewhat less protective than in the short term, the non-agency or polarized agency. Right? Uh, in as much as this kid is feeling the distress, he's not protecting himself from the distress by numbing it or by not seeing the other. He is deeply feeling the distress. Um, but rigidified constructions of moral agency may become problematic if sustained over the long term and uh, in an unchanged way. If they're not if they uh, remain unchanged for a long time, research has shown actually that accounts that construct a sense of agency that is frozen or trapped in a particular set of actions, shackled to the past. Okay, is maladaptive in the long term because such accounts tend to perpetuate the unresolved event and limit growth. Mm -hmm. We're talking about mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the profound shame that this uh, and self condemnation that this kid is feeling um, is is uh, this shame and self condemnation surround this type of agency construction, and ultimately they may lead to withdrawal. Um, thereby decreasing chances for corrective or reparative actions. So this is a person who's so, in fact, we were, this is one of the kids that we worried the most about for suicide, okay, and we had him watched after, after the fact, uh, because he was really at risk. And over the long term, if not suicide, at the very least, we would expect that this sort of self-condemnation and shame would lead him to hide away, to withdraw from friendships, withdraw from relationships, and therefore not get any chance to engage in any sort of preparation. Now, he can't repair what he did, but he can engage, he could possibly engage in other sorts of preparations. This sort of construction doesn't allow that, because he already knows that his death will be like that, he will forever remember it, he will never be able to forget it, right? Okay. So let me offer some, and uh, let's see what time it is. Let me offer some concluding thoughts. So, yes. Sí. <laughs> Te condenas, ¿no? ¿Cierto? ¿Cómo, cómo, se, ¿Cómo se puede entender como el rol de las emociones, de los sentimientos en la posibilidad como de crecer o reparar algo en términos de moral agency? Uh -huh. Aun cuando la experiencia sea muy, tan eh, como, claro, tan terrible y tan de consenso en la humanidad que eso rompe un como un casi un tabú, ¿no? Claro. De que tú no, una, no destruyes a otra persona. Que no se ve, no es se una cocina moral mm -hmm. muy, muy básica. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're going to talk about that. Okay. okay. We're going to talk exactly about that. I mean, a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about that, and then you shoot questions. Okay. Um, 
So, concluding thoughts. Just a few concluding thoughts. First of all, psychologists often think, think of Bandura, you know, as, as a, a very common um, person that we think about when, we think, when people think about kids and war, Bandura. Psychologists often think of youth in war-torn countries, especially those who became involved in struggles and who themselves perpetrated harm, as being morally disengaged. You know the term moral disengagement? What's the word in Spanish? Como, eh, como desapego. Desapego. Uh -huh. Pero no desapego como attachment. No, no, no. Como compromiso. Ausencia de compromiso. Claro, eso es. Good. Okay. So in English, that's moral disengagement. Mm -hmm. the, and the idea is that you, you mm -hmm. use different strategies to push away your moral thoughts, and therefore you convince yourself either that what you're doing is right, or that whatever you're doing is not your fault. Okay, that, those are the basics. If you look at Bandura, I mean, of course, it's more complicated than just a sentence, but um, the, the idea is that people use all kinds of strategies, uh, morally disengagement strategies like dehumanization and rationalization to convince themselves either that the, what they're doing is not wrong or that what they're doing is not their fault. And, and the worrisome part about moral disengagement, according to Bandura and other people doing research from this perspective, is that once you're morally disengaged, you can go on doing violence to others without really being troubled by it, right? Because you have disengaged yourself from moral concepts. Um, I, I don't think that moral disengagement is what's going on here, okay? Um, I think that moral disengagement doesn't accurately capture uh, what's going on in some of these kids. And I, and, I'm, and I don't mean to say that there's never moral disengagement. But I think there is a good chunk of experiences for these kids where they're not morally disengaged. First of all, these kids, if you think about the three stories that I told you under, um, that, trust me, but they're you know, representative of the sorts of stories that we have, these kids don't appear to be untroubled by their actions. Um, in fact, when you think back about the three accounts that I gave you, these youth are not presenting their actions as desirable or as reasonable, and in fact, um, they're not presenting themselves as doing the right thing. And in fact, we asked them, after they told us the story, if what they had done was morally right or wrong, and they all consistently said that it was morally wrong. I want to suggest that these stories, though they're very different from one another, uh, they're best understood not as instances of moral disengagement, but as, a, but as problematic ways in which you come to terms with, or avoid coming to terms with, having done harmful acts. So I think that these kids are not morally disengaged. In fact, I think these kids are engaged, they are grappling with their moral agency, but they're doing that in problematic ways. They either numb their sense of agency, or they produce imbalanced constructions of agency, or they produce rigidified uh, constructions of agency. And we have a few more, but those are the three that we talked about that. Now, why does it matter? Why does it matter whether we talk about it as moral disengagement or as difficult constructions of moral agency? Well, it matters because um, people who work with Bandura's model, with the model of moral disengagement, if you think about this as a, moral, as a problem of moral disengagement, then the solution for it, and here I'm going to, starting to, to, to try to answer your question, um, the solution for moral disengagement this engagement is shoring up, buttressing these kids' moral concepts. It's like teaching them again what's right and wrong, as though they forgot what's right and wrong. Okay? It's reinstating in them the belief that what they did was morally wrong. That those are the strategies if you think about it as moral disengagement. Now, by contrast, is if we think about if we think about these kids as having difficulties wrestling with their own moral agency, we need to be concerned not so much about their concepts of right and wrong, because I think they have them, okay? But with the ways in which they construct and reconstruct the details of their experiences, and with the specific difficulties that they have integrating those details into a sense of their own imperfect moral agency. 
Those are very different strategies. Those are very different solutions mm -hmm. for this problem, okay, in terms of what happens next. And so this brings me to some concluding thoughts about intervention. But I remind you, I'm not, uh, I'm not a clinician. Um, so I'm, I'm aware of clinical work. I work with clinicians. But uh, what I'm looking for is some general ideas about intervention that um, hopefully become useful for clinicians working with children in poor um, countries. Um, ultimately, and I, I want to give you any more um, slides. I just want I just want us to think together. So ultimately, of course, the question is how to help these young people reconcile themselves or integrate their experiences in ways that help them heal, okay, that help them feel better. In this regard, I think that the stories that kids tell us um, are not only a way for understanding what is wrong with them, um, their stories are also likely to be a way to put things right again. Um, this process might be accompanied um, or might be accomplished via the, you know, the creation of narrative accounts with other people, hopefully the right kind of adults. Um, because it's through joint narration. If you think about your own kids, your students or your own children, if you have them, right? when they are aroused, when they're upset, when they did something wrong, when they're confused, or when someone hurt them. Those are the times when adults can step in and help them, help them retell the story, rethink the story, understand new perspectives, gather new points of view, okay? So it's the same for these kids. The creation of, the recreation, the reconstruction of these kids' stories with other adults through joint narration have the potential for helping them gather new perspectives on their own actions and on other people's actions and create different meanings um, that change their initial understanding. And that includes this kid who thought he would never be able to get over it, right? But also includes the kid who wasn't thinking at all and th or feeling anything. So any of those kids could benefit from recreating, reconstructing the same stories with some guidance from adults. Now, the idea that people's constructions and reconstruction of their own story may become a source of healing um, and development is not new. I did not invent it. And if you are a clinician, then you know that, right? Uh, and in fact, they have been. This idea has been frequently used for therapeutic purposes, including uh, with the victims of PTSD. Um, you know what PTSD is, yeah? Uh, in including victims of war. Uh, now, typically in context of war, where the goal is the treatment of post-traumatic stress, uh, people are encouraged to talk repeatedly about the traumatic event, events, and the assumption is that this talking re-exposure, or through this talking re-exposure, re will ultimately lead to a reduction of symptoms, depression, anxiety, and so on. That's true. There's research about that. Those of you who are um, clinicians know it. Uh, best. Now, if narratives are to be used not just for reducing PTSD symptoms, but for reconstructing a sense of moral agency, then that may not be enough. Just talking again about what happened may not be enough, and there must be, we must have a few additional considerations. As a first step, um, it might be important to encourage youth to recount their own experiences of wrongdoing in ways that help them reconstruct or reconstitute the factual and the mental elements, details of the events they were involved in, and elaborate their own sense of agency, elaborate the other people's agency. Who did what, when, why, what was happening, including uncertainties, doubts, what you didn't know, what you didn't know at the time, what you know now to be different, all of that needs to go into their stories. The elaboration of factual and psychological details can help kids construct um, more elaborated and integrated accounts of their own agency. Um, there are various mechanisms that we're studying now through which that happened. First, elaborated narratives place 
the events in the context of meaningful, understandable actions and consequences and desires and beliefs, but also elaborated narratives contain events in time by marking past tense, present past tense, present tense, future tense, right? So placing wrongdoings and traumas in the past give them some sense of closure, as opposed to that, I will always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, researchers like Pennebaker and others have suggested that re this renders experiences more contained, that uh, experiences lead to less intrusion when they're contained in the past. Um, they uh, tend to impact functioning less. Uh, but elaborating the narratives, narratives that search for meaning and lessons, can also transform purely negative experiences into source or perceptions of strength, of resilience, of growth. Again, narratives, elaborated, even in elaborated narratives, can't undo torture, but they can give new meanings to the situation. They can create new sources of meaning, new sources of strength, new sources of um, lessons and insights. So if we think about these kids not in terms of being morally disengaged, but in terms of having difficulties constructing their own sense of agency, then an important first step would be to scaffold their stories, to help them tell stories that can reconstruct or reconstitute all the details of their own agency. Now, and let me show you a couple of pictures. Um, an important issue to consider, and this turns out to be quite a challenge in this process, is that adults who work with kids at war um, are often eager to relieve their sense of guilt. So a very common and very caring response to any of these kids is, don't worry, it was not your fault, right? And in some sense, it wasn't their fault, right? But um, obviously, um, so, so adults want to point to, to the coercion, to the lack of uh, responsibility, to the lack of choice. Statements such as, you were the victim, it was not your fault, or you had no choice, are part of a natural parent response. But paradoxically, these statements also act to undermine the children's sense of agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in fact, we I was witness to some people telling, you know, not any of these kids, but you know, other kids, well, it was not your fault. Mm -hmm. And the kid looked at them and said, Usted no me entiende. Mm -hmm. Okay, meaning you really don't understand me. It was my choice. I did it. This is what they're saying. I had a kid who said, you know, who told one of the stories of, you know, the commandante told me not to kill him. And, and if, he, if I didn't kill him, he would kill me. So I killed him. And he said, but the other kid, he didn't. So that means I had a choice. Now, what a choice, right? It's not that we're saying, yay, this is a great choice. Of course not. But if you tell these kids you have no choice, you are not understanding their age, their agentic experience. And in fact, you're undermining their attempt at creating a sense of their own imperfect moral agency, mm -hmm. which is what I think what we're shooting for. Mm -hmm. So um, if these kids are going to be capable of making moral choices in the future, OK? Uh, they need to construct or reconstruct the sense of their own agency, and that including, includes acknowledging that they did things in the past that were hurtful and profoundly wrong. Um, therefore, it, it is important, and this is very difficult when we work with um, clinicians in the, in the displaced camps, it's very hard to get them to believe us that it's important for, for adults assisting in this process not to deny the wrongness of what these kids have done. In doing so undermines their attempts at making sense of what they did and at forgiving themselves, in ultimately. But we should also be vigilant of the other extreme, and that's the third story, right? There will be children who will feel irredeemably bad, irredeemably evil, irredeemably immoral. And we should worry about this too, because profound shame and self-condemnation will lead to withdrawal, which in turn really increases the chances for re reinserting themselves in, into um, civilian life. So what is needed, I think, is to work towards accepting an imperfect moral self. Uh, we need to help youth to examine and to acknowledge what they did, 
without being defined by it. And that's the beginning of the response. Okay. Uh, while we should not excuse them, uh, we should help them retell their story in a way that helps them contemplate and appreciate the complexity of the context, the awful choices that they had, and work towards accepting themselves as complex moral agents that are capable of doing bad things and also good things. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, questions? Yeah. Bueno, ofrecemos la palabra cualquier comentario, pregunta que quieran hacer. It's really, really good research. Encaixen. Así practico. I'm from, I still do Brazil, because tampoco. Ah, bueno, está bien. Perfect. Any language you want. Uh -huh. Perdón, no, 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 no. Maravilloso, encontré muy buena, en verdad. Eh, y también eh, fue intentar trabajar con eh, moral y disertación también. Entonces, estoy súper interesada. Yo estaba interesada en verdad, eh, quizás trabajar con también, eh, ver si Interbook Contact uh -huh. puede eh, ayudar al desarrollo moral de las personas. Entonces, cuando tú me dijiste en algún momento también eh, de que las personas no toman la perspectiva de lo que es la antigua, uh -huh. ¿crees que al conocer a otro grupo, al conocer la realidad, no son personas ajenas, así como un ser abstracto, sino personas reales? That's a very good question and one that you know people often assume that that's, that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And not only did people assume that, but in North America, both the United States and Canada, and I think Europe too, but I'm aware of North, North America, have thrown millions of dollars into projects of encounter, like in the Middle East, Palestinian and Jewish kids. Like mm -hmm. they have summer camps and they, they um, bring them to you know places in the Middle East, but they also bring them outside into the United States or Canada, thinking that bringing them into an outside context, you know, will help them. And um, Phil Hammack, you mm -hmm. want to read his book? Um, Phil Hammack actually has probably a pretty sad and sobering news about the fact that even though in the short term these encounters appear to be positive in the long term, unfortunately, they um, lead to, I mean, kids end up with more pol polarized and rigid and self-righteous uh, representations of themselves and others. Is that correct? You guys know, yeah. you know Phil? Yeah. Uh, Phil, Phil Hamrick is the work you want to you see. Again, the assumption you have is a very reasonable assumption. If we only get to know people, we will see that they don't have horns, right? That they're real people, just like us. And a lot of money has been thrown at that. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't always work. It doesn't mean it never works, and it probably works for some kids, mm -hmm. but uh, consistent, like systematic research, like the one uh, Phil Hammack did in the Middle East, so shows that this may not be sufficient to help people understand the other perspective, in particular in the face of ongoing injustices, right? One of the things that I remember of having seen the presentation and what they showed in the film Hammond is that the principal problem, at least in the Middle East, was to return to the same context. Exactly. To return to the same context where al final se producía como un, una reversa del, del efecto, porque el, la potencia, digamos, del contexto en el cual se da la injusticia y la, y la, y la desigualdad, mm -hmm. y además el volver, digamos, con tus propios pares, mm -hmm. donde que no habían, entre comillas, cambiado, no habían sido expuestos, te hacía volver, digamos, a tus a tu visiones originales. Entonces, lo que yo pienso, digamos, mm -hmm. que en situaciones por lo menos tan límites como esa, uh -huh. a menos que haya algún tipo de cambio en el contexto, Exacto. esto va a ser algo que se va a producir temporalmente, pero, no. pero, pero tú vuelves a tu misma o realidad, peor. Y, o peor. Claro, y claro, no vuelves a la realidad y, y te vuelves, digamos, a, a, a el, el, el peso del contexto, digamos, social en ese caso. Yeah. Muy, so if you can solve the problem in the Middle East, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You can solve the problem, then get the people together to know each other and it'll be all good. But as long as you cannot solve the problem in the Middle East, just bringing them to a summer camp somewhere, it's not enough. Es como una solución en la medida que producen los cambios estructurales para poder 
move on a algo sí. distinto, sí. claro, pero si no, si sí, las condiciones se mantienen es muy difícil. Sí. Sí. Algo que yo quería comentar a propósito también de, lo, de la investigación de, de Phil era que en tu diseño, en tu problema, en, en el estudio, una cosa que podría ser importante también es eh, averiguar bastante de cuáles son las condiciones como de injusticia o de percibir. Porque muchas veces se toma como, obviamente, la hostilidad, o, pero, pero la parte también de la ideología, porque en algunos de estos casos era que, eh, bueno, volver el contexto, pero también si tú sentías que legítimamente estabas en condiciones de colaborar sin renunciar a algo, como la parte del de el, el significado de cuán injusto puede ser en términos mucho más como afectivos, ideológicos, más por sobre la voluntad a colaborar, hasta qué punto traiciona también tu identidad. Como o sea, que es, muy, es mucho más complicado de lo que uno se imagina. De ver en tu, en tu caso, si efectivamente podría, lo que a veces es muy difícil es que puedan colaborar en situaciones de equidad. ¿no? Entonces, que a veces históricamente... Sí, y, la, y las... Um, Ideology is a, it's a double-edged sword. It, it really is a double-edged sword. So ideology is what organizes in some way protects people, right? Because um, kids, both in the Middle East, kids um, are highly ideologically aware. It's part of their history, it's part of their symbols, their na nations, on both sides, right? And so ideology is what tells them we're doing the right thing, we're right. So even if you're throwing rocks or you know, participating in war or anything like that, we're doing the right thing, we're fighting for a just cause. So ideology is protective, but ideology also blinds you to the other and perpetuates those cycles. So just getting them together is not enough unless the conflict, the structural pieces or you know, historical pieces of the conflict could be addressed. It's, It's a very good question. It's not that your question doesn't make sense. And many, many people for a very long time assumed that you know what you say is what would happen. That's not what the that's not what the research tells us. Tengo una pregunta respecto a estos tres tipos de problemáticas formas de enfrentar el tema que tú mencionaste y Quería preguntar que me, me cuesta entenderlas como formas problemáticas eh, sin un contexto específico. Entiendo que cuando sacamos a un niño en un contexto de, 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 de guerra, etc., lo ponemos en, 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 como en la sociedad pacífica, uh -huh. lo que hay que hacer como para intervenir es cambiarles el switch e instalarlos en una sociedad donde el concepto de ser es individual, eh, etc., y eh, esa nación tiene sentido. Pero desde un punto de vista como de, eh, moral, me parece que estos tres modos son, son en realidad eh, difícilmente eh, cuestionables en su moralidad porque son protectores para el ser, pero ah, también protectores para el, grupo, para el grupo. Ayudan a ser. Y de hecho, si yo pienso en mí mismo, yo, yo diría que la mayor parte del tiempo funciono en este numb uh, como <risa> modo porque cuando voy por la calle no me preocupo si hay un tipo que se durmiendo en el suelo o la mujer de al lado está sufriendo por no sé qué cosa yo vengo a mi trabajo y eso me permite funcionar y que alguien cuestione mi moralidad porque esté funcionando en eso la mayor parte del tiempo me parece como impreciso digamos. y o sea lo mismo no sé el segundo mecanismo esto del imbalance es decir si voy al doctor yo espero que su moralidad sea imbalanceada y que él no me trate como un ser humano sino que me trate como una cosa porque eso va a como a ayudarlo a hacer lo más objetivo posible respecto a mi propio, como, a mi propio problema y así entonces eh, solo podría definirlo como un problema si es que eh, lo que estoy haciendo es como intervenir teniendo como una noción de self normativa en, perspect como en perspectiva, pero no me parece un problemático como por default. De por sí. Esa es la complicación. I mean, you're an adult and you are capable of using different strategies to engage with different aspects of reality. And we all, you know, living in Uh, in countries where there's poverty in the streets, right, and it's visible, uh, we all learn to turn off some of that, right, to not pay attention. Sometimes we do, but many times we don't. And you certainly hope that a surgeon who's cutting into your stomach is not, you know, thinking of you as like, you know, this sweet person, but like really focusing on this little piece of you or something like that. So we all, as adults, have the capacity to turn on and off these strategies. 
problem with these kids because they haven't had that, because this happened so early on, where the experience of turning on and off and of having flexible strategies, of having multiple strategies, that's what, what war and chronic violence has robbed them on, of. So uh, the problem with these kids is that they're applying the same strategies across contexts, with their friends, with their families, when they go to school, industry, everywhere. And it's the inflexibility, and in fact, this is um, consistent with what clinicians uh, talk about trauma, is that the inflexible sort of strategy, it's when a strategy becomes inflexible and generalized that it becomes a real problem. So some of our work looked at how kids tell different kinds of stories. And the problem with these kids is that they tell, so we ask them about a time when they hurt someone. We ask them about a time when they help someone. We ask them about a time with a friend. We ask them about different situations. And they tend to use the same sort of strategy across contexts. And that's when we know that those kids are having some problem. Um, we all can turn on and off, um, I mean, uh, you know, our, our empathic capacities. That's not, um, that in and of itself doesn't mean that you don't have a sense of moral agency. But the fact that these kids are generalizing these sort of strategies across contexts that they haven't, in some of these kids, have lived all their life in war. Um, today, and this is what in part brought us to doing uh, work with psychophysiological measures as well. Uh, we know that high arousal, constant arousal, changes the wiring of the brain in ways that you actually cannot attend to certain details in your experience, you're just, just not seeing them, which is not the same as being able to flexibly turn things on and off. So, uh, yes, I agree with you, these are um, adaptive strategies in the moment. What we worry about is what happens next. So these kids, are going to be the leaders of this country, right, or the citizens of this country with whom we will have to make peace at some time. And if these kids really cannot think about other people, about themselves or other people in, sen in this, in, with some sense of moral choice, then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. De acuerdo contigo, pero haciendo la ciencia salvedad, en sociedades mm -hmm. altamente colectivistas, sí. esto también funcionaría. Porque esta idea de dar agencia al otro, responde a una concepción de ser bastante individual ¿no? pero si en el fondo estoy en una sociedad tribal donde lo que, lo que yo debo hacer está altamente prescrito lo mejor que puedo hacer es no tratar de darle un ser propio cuando dices lo mejor que puedo hacer you mean it's adaptive right mm -hmm. it's adaptive and in fact um, this work with Papa, we did some other work in Papua New Guinea that we haven't yet published but the strange fact the peculiar, peculiar finding there is that kids talk about uh, not only aggressive acts, but also pro-social acts in terms of tit for tat. Él me dijo, yo le dije. Él me dio, yo le dio. Yo, él me sacó, yo le saqué. Él me pegó, yo le pegué. Él me, me ayudó, yo le ayudé. Hmm? Never in sense of, I helped him because he's a nice person, or I helped him because I wanted to, or I helped him because he asked me to. It's always in that sense. It's very restricted sense of moral, of a moral world, let's say. Is it adaptive there? Yes, except they're killing each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have muchas razones. It's definitely not, we're not going to say that, I would never say that, you know, psychological reasons are the reasons that are leading the world. I mean, clearly it's multi-determined. In fact, the serious war, serious problems in Papua New Guinea really started when weapons started coming in, when Western weapons started coming in. And their form of resolving conflict, their form of understanding and resolving conflict, coupled with having access to small weapons that 10-year-olds can carry, really changed the world. Estoy seguro de la certeza de este dato, pero creo que escuché hablar de él, así que pinche, diciendo que la probabilidad de morir por una acción directa de un congénero humano en el siglo XX es muy baja comparado con los siglos anteriores. Es decir, incluyendo la dos de los mundiales. Es decir, vivimos en un mundo, si comparamos la, en, lo que estamos, está bien, ¿eh? pero vivimos en un mundo harto más pacífico del que vivíamos hace mucho tiempo. Así. 
Entonces, eh, bueno, no podría hablar de la colonización de Occidente como una parte importante, una hipótesis. Mi pregunta es, ¿cómo, eso, cómo esa reflexión calza con el, el trabajo que tú haces? Si Mira, esto es lo que no me calza. Esto. Eh, esta, cuando yo leí hace, hace un par de semanas estaba terminando un trabajo ¿no? y quise, quise ver, tenía que ver mis estadísticas porque ya hacía tiempo que no las había mirado y subió a un millón de un millón, un millón de niños en este momento pues son de 6 o 7 millones de personas entonces, pero la pregunta, pero el dato es morir por acción directa de un contexto claro, no, no claro. Es mismo que entonces no es lo mismo Solo dos millones han sido matados. Solo dos millones han sido matados. Estoy diciendo que está bien. No, 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 instante. Estoy hablando de la trayectoria. De, sí, sí, sí. De, 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 Entonces me, me estás preguntando si me, si me parece que hay progreso. Eh, ¿Puede uno, ser? ¿Y cómo, cómo la investigación que tú haces, por ejemplo, con relación al desarrollo moral, uh -huh. tiene algo que ver, por ejemplo, uh -huh. más que con eso, tiene, por ejemplo, que ver con la instauración de sistemas de justicia, uh -huh. de sistemas de control social, eh, muchas veces con Diego? que anda o que no anda esa es, la pregunta. Sí. es una pregunta bien interesante no sé I, I, I really don't know um, how to think about it I, mean, I am immersed in the world of violence <laughs> I live in the world of violence I mean I think about violence constantly and so it's an inter it's a hopeful piece of uh, data that Pinsker provided that we are doing better than in the 16th century it's probably true Um, are we getting better in terms of moral agency? I don't know. We have so many examples of things going wrong. Right? I don't know. It's an interesting. Thank you for sharing it because it really I will I will keep thinking about it. I I, um, I don't I don't have a way and I don't know that psychological <laughs> research can provide an answer to that. Can evolutionary research maybe? It's possible, you know, and, and things are maybe coming from there. Um, I'm not sure. It's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Ahora, yeah. que la prioridad sea más baja también, no cambia la expectativa, claro, que no sea desde la perspectiva de la lente que uno la mire. Claro. Yo estoy más seguro. Cuando ahora que hace pero, sí, 60 años atrás, cuando acá, cuando acá, cuando acá, siguiendo con tu línea de pensamiento también, pero, eh, ¿Ah? depende, eso puede depender también de las condiciones materiales de la sociedad y no solamente con el desarrollo. Es no, ya, yeah, of course, es no, 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 eh, moralmente más avanzado y por lo tanto eso explica que ahora ah, bueno es otra alternativa pero, pero hablando de digamos, términos morales pero, pero yo creo que hay, hay condiciones eh, materiales. materiales digamos de, o, o de cómo se organiza la sociedad no sé eso mm -hmm. podría ser claro pero, pero es especulación obviamente sí. eh. es una cuestión y también creo que coming from uh, evolutionary psychology if you want to stay within psychology then Evolution and psychology would be to go be the way to go rather than individual yeah, um, psychology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting it's an interesting um, piece of data. I'll look it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good. It's hopeful. I'll write it down. Hay que pensar en 400 años más. No se va a morir nada. En 2000 años más. No se va a morir nada. Se van a morir otra cosa. Claro. Claro. <laughs> Igual estamos en la hora y tenemos que terminar, pero una, una, un comentario que, que tenía en relación a que, que creo que de, de ninguna manera yo interpretaría los resultados como que implica eh, un ideal moral, de, sino que más bien es como el rol de sí mismo y es verdad que hay sociedad esta, esta idea de colectivista que es un término como... Uh -huh. Creo que igual, aunque sea un sesgo muy psicológico, todas las sociedades definen un límite entre persona y otros. Siempre están algunas más, otros y otros. Entonces, 
A mí lo que me, me llama la atención y lo, lo estaba además relacionando con, el, con, el, con también la investigación que ha hecho Skill en, 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 uh -huh. en cómo el conflicto, o sea, inicialmente, y, y también decías como la intervención con personas que tienen trauma, estos niños, uh -huh. como no, no fue tu culpa, es como. Este, este pensar o evaluar si verdaderamente las capacidades de inventarse o reconstruirse de una noción de sí mismo pueden ser plásticas en distintos contextos, porque obviamente es contexto, ¿no? Pero, pero si tú lo piensas, ¿cómo esto se aplica a razonar sobre lo moral? Que, que no, no creo que tenga que ver con que estos niños estén mal o bien, sino que la noción de moral, sino que también tiene que ver más bien como cómo se construye la representación de su experiencia. Que, que efectivamente toda la formación que antes teníamos en desarrollo moral iba como en negar este rol de agencia. O sea, tú decís, en los niños que compartan rápidamente para que no sean egoístas, entonces mm -hmm. los padres, los profesores, hagamos compartir. Después se ve que no a menos que no se peleen, a menos que negocien, no sé. Ahora, a menos que tú te hagas cargo de alguna manera que tú culturalmente pudieras, no sé, uh -huh. un niño soldado, eh, encontrar algún otro significado de esa experiencia, probablemente eh, eh, va a tener más flexibilidad, por decirlo en términos. Yo lo Dame yo más estrategias. De, de self, uh -huh. de self y self other, más que el contenido de lo que estaba o de tu experiencia. Uh -huh. Y eso puede ser súper psicológico y súper evolutivo, pero, pero es una manera como a mí me, me puedo pensar en esto, en esta en narrativa, ¿no? Y, y de la última que te resultó tan difícil, sí después de hablarlo te entender. Sí, y de hecho tenía curiosidad por ver si en el laboratorio hay diferencia entre la emotional re, de la re, reactividad psicofisiológica entre los tres tipos de narrativas o. Pues no so, obviamente no tenemos esto es claro. Chico, no. De... No, pero algo que fuera como uh -huh. en términos de, uh -huh. porque uno igual, nosotros igual viendo las que nosotros tenemos en investigación, uh -huh. tenemos algunas que son puras acciones, no son uh -huh. respecto a wrong, no son respecto a, a situaciones dañas, pero uh -huh. son, fulano me dijo, yo hice, oye, esto, esto, pero no tiene nada de experiencia. Entonces, uh -huh. como que con otros contenidos, pero podrían ser estructuras narrativas parecidas. Entonces, we definitely get different patterns of reactivity to different kinds of stories, but we also get a lot of individual differences okay. within stories. Mm -hmm. So we so we are really looking both at the uh, type of agency construction as one variable, but then individual differences are huge in reactivity. And and uh, as far as reactivity among children, we know so little actually. A lot of the research with psychophysiological reactivity has been done with adults, and so we're trying to figure out uh, where are the parameters for this. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It's been really interesting. This is, we're just, you know, we visited the lab, we've been doing this for a few years, but it's just the beginning of it. Um, we also have reactivity to ignorance and sadness. We haven't yet tried reactivity to shame and get shame and get into mm -hmm. it. And that's the next step. Mm -hmm. um, and we started with anger and sadness because uh, uh, there is more knowledge, there's more evidence about reactivity to anger in adults. So we started from something that we know, and now we're pulling it into other areas. But for moral, uh, the moral world, shame, shame and guilt mm -hmm. are really crucial. So that's mm -hmm. the next step. Mm -hmm. It's been interesting, but really confusing sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as we thought it was going to be. Oh, you have a number. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> bueno, ¿alguna otra pregunta o comentario? Bueno, le damos un aplauso entonces. Y a todos ustedes por asistir en este día. En el día de hoy.